uh, here to speak on an issue. So if you approach and give us your name and address, please. My name is Kathy Mayball, and I live at 64 Julian Lane, just off Thompson Street, not far from here. Uh, can you all hear me? This will be very short. Um, I've been following the Chatham Park development off and on. <laughs> not always religiously, it's kind of confusing to keep up with what's going on. But my neighbor uh, has pointed out the maps that are currently on the website that are, as I understand it, under review by the planning board. And I've stopped by the planning board a couple of times and talked to different people about, you know, how to understand the maps, what exactly is going on. And of course, I'm the last house on Julianne Lane. So Collector Road A that's been proposed off Thompson Street is actually going to come very close to my house and my neighbor's house. Um, when I stopped by the planning board originally, I was told that the edge of my land will be at the most 90 feet from Collector Road A. My neighbor's house um, is going to be 40 feet from Collector Road A. Currently, of course, that's wooded area. and Daly's Academy will be developed not far, you know, just to the right of that distance. Um, again, I wasn't sure where to put in my feedback on this, but what I'd like to ask Chatham Park to do, and my neighbor agrees, is build a very substantial berm on the near, the far side, the northern side of my property, that would be the southern edge of Collector Road A, that would reduce the noise from this construction, uh, which clearly is going to be very substantial over a significant amount of time. I don't know what the timeline for development is going to be. Not sure if talked to different people in the planning board and gotten different stories on what the status is of approval of Collector Road A, et cetera, and that development. So I'm also wondering how I even find out where we are. I was told that my first trip to the plane board, I was told everything's been approved by the town and now we're waiting to hear back from Chatham Park on proposed amendments or negotiations by the town. Second time I was there, I was told, no, that's not true. Nothing's been approved yet by the town and currently the status of this proposal is with the town. So that'll be a second point. Uh, but the primary reason I'm here, again, is to ask that the town or whatever the process is would request that a very substantial burn be built by uh, Chatham Park just south of Collector Road A, primarily for noise. But on a secondary basis, there is a tremendous amount of water that comes down that hill. We've all seen it pooling on Thompson Street just south of, uh, I'm sorry, just west of Fire Tower Road when we've had really big storms come through. And really pours into my backyard. I've actually built a small ditch there to make that runoff down the hill. Uh, we're concerned also that as that land is cleared, that the runoff is going to be uh, increased. And so I thought that would be a second argument for the building of a berm that would help funnel that water off and away from our properties. And I'm sure that there's an engineering group for the town that's looking at water mitigation, but I wanted to bring it up since I was here. And uh, I'm trying to keep it short, that's it. Uh, any, uh, any, any further explanation of where we are in this process would be appreciated. And of course, we're hoping for some noise mitigation. What was your address again? 64 Julianne Lane. I'm the very last house on Julianne Lane. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and Kathy had spoken to me before the meeting, and I suggested that she go ahead and uh, use the public expression, uh, and public comment period as a vehicle for introducing herself and her concerns, both to the planning and engineering department that are sitting behind okay. you, and then the officials from Chatham Park who were in the next row. So thank you. Yes, you're very welcome. Are there any other speakers for the citizens public expression period? Those that did not sign up perhaps? If not, then we'll move to commissioner updates. And this is the period of time in which we talk about the meetings that we've been to and the things that have um, uh, 
think they have been attended to by us since the last meeting. I have passed out to you all a copy of a letter from the North Carolina uh, Water Quality Division. Um, we continue to make progress on uh, the matter of 1,4 dioxane and this letter is a wonderful uh, summary of the conference call we had a couple of weeks ago about water quality in the San Francisco <coughs> and the Cape Fear Basin and um, and it's a very encouraging letter from the state officials. Um, I've also had additional um, uh, discussions with the mayors of Greensboro and Reedsville in the last week um, and really look forward to being able to make further progress on that. Saturday, I um, had a wonderful uh, day of working with 60 uh, high schoolers at the Institute of Government. They were high school students interested in environmental matters and Diana Hales and I from Chatham County and the town of Pittsburgh um, were interviewed by these high school students and I think there's nothing any more thrilling than um, having an impact on young people, um, especially about the environment, and they were just absolutely terrific, had a good time. And tomorrow I'll be reading at Pittsburgh Primary School and um, um, reading to, I think, second graders. So, um, are there people who have attended Fairground, PBA, Council of Government, Main Street, any other meetings of organizations? I have a triangle J, but my voice is not going to allow me to talk about it tonight, so I had to do it at the next meeting. I have not uh, had a Main Street or a PBA meeting, but uh, there is a meeting tomorrow evening, uh, Roadhouse at 6.30, uh, Main Street meeting, and um, a presentation by Kevin Horn, uh, the designers of the first four projects um, slated. <coughs> I understand, by the way, that the Roadhouse will not be serving food in the back, um, and um, the meeting is simply being held there, but they are not serving dinner. Um, they just did not want it to appear that there was, um, I guess the word would be self-serving, um, although that's sort of fun too, but um, the, uh, <laughs> so there will not be table service in the back during that meeting. I would encourage people to come and speak out. I think that's the narrowing of the courthouse circle has continued to be something that the town folks and constituents and passers through have commented on and I think that um, the more questions we can ask the better prepared we'll be for knowing what's going to happen and the more we'll have an input in what's happening. Anything else? Then um, under old business our first Item under old business is the rezoning request on 15501. Victoria Bailiff will assist us on um, this item. Okay. Um, we have rezoning REC 2017-01. Graham and Mary Oldham have proposed to rezone 2985 U.S. Highway 15501 North from RA2 Residential Agriculture to C2 Highway Commercial. The parcel is approximately 0.62 acres. It has been zoned RA2 since the late 1980s and previously housed base, base hits and indoor batting cage. The parking lot currently in place straddles the western property line. The adjoining property owner will no longer be allowing the Grams to use her portion of the parking lot. The Grams are aware that the parking and buffer requirements of any future use must be met without the benefits of any parking availabilities on the adjoining plot. The future land use plan has designated this property for medium density residential. And the surrounding properties are currently zoned RA2 to the north and east, to the west, RA5, and to the south, a mix of RA2 and PDD. Although the proposed amendment is inconsistent with the future land use plan, staff is recommending approval as the proposed property is positioned along US Highway 15501, a major arterial, and in close proximity to other properties which are commercial in nature. Staff finds this location to be suitable 
for C2 Highway Commercial Zoning District. A public hearing was held on February 13th. Attorney Patrick Bradshaw spoke on behalf of his clients, Grandma Mary Oldham, stating that they intend to comply with any zoning requirements and fully understand that they will no longer be allowed access to parking, which was previously provided by an adjacent landowner. Attorney Wade Barber spoke on behalf of his client, Ann Robertson, affirming that she is not opposed to the rezoning, but wishes it to be known that her property will no longer be available for use by the Grams and would like to be assured that the town will enforce all requirements for the zoning district. The planning board considered this rezoning at their meeting on February 6th. The board found that the proposed amendment was inconsistent with the future land use plan, but rec recommended to approve in a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Uh, although we've had a public hearing and, and oftentimes we do, um, uh, we proceed with, without uh, additional comment. Patrick Bradshaw had asked if he might uh, speak additionally this evening, and so I'd like to recognize Patrick Bradshaw. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate that. Uh, I was concerned at the public hearing about a perception that seemed to have developed about how the building originally came to be built and used for what it was. The planner has emphasized to me that the question before you all tonight is whether this C2 zoning and the uses that would be allowed under that are appropriate for this property. I'd like to suggest to you that they are. There are a large number of other commercial properties, even though much of the surrounding zoning is residential agricultural. There are a large number of business properties that have been used for business purposes for a long time. Um, there is no one in the public, no citizens, no adjoining property owners have opposed this rezoning request. The building that is there is legally constructed. It has been there for nearly 15 years. It is not in anybody's best interest, not the property owner, not the adjoiners, and certainly not the interest of the town of Pittsburgh for that building to go unused. It's not appropriate for residential use. It's not in anybody's best interest for it to fall into disrepair and disuse. So I would suggest to you that the interests of the public health, safety, and welfare would be best served by approving this rezoning request so that that property can be put to reasonable uses. If you all have concerns about the history and how things developed the way they did, I'd be happy to talk about that. But I agree that I don't think it's strictly relevant to, to the question that's before you. Thank you very much. Other questions? The board for Mr. Bradshaw. Okay. All right. And I see that we have uh, on our desk uh, your resolution adopting the consistency statement. Yes. And that is different from the one that is in your in package. package right? Yeah. And it corrected Exhibit A, right? Mm -hmm. That was for the yeah. annexation. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any other questions for Victoria Bailiff, or is there a motion to be made? I don't have any questions, but I would like to go ahead and make a motion to uh, approve this rezoning to C2. Um, I have the confidence in, and I'll just, you know, not just in the motion, but the uh, the items that have applied for this was put in, in here today planning on doing everything consistent with the zoning and uh, they live back there behind that property so uh, you know, I feel very comfortable that everything will be taken care of in a proper manner. So I'd like to go ahead and make a motion mm -hmm. to uh, approve this rezoning to C2. Second. Motion by Jay Farrell, seconded by Beth Wilson Foley. Are there any further questions? Would you care to make a consistency statement or for the motion to rezone? You need to do consistency first. I mean, that's a resolution, and the other is an ordinance. And you could do both at one time if you are okay. inclined to do that. Okay. Thank you. You could go oh. separately. Well. Would your motion, Jay and Beth, I'd like to be to adopt the consistency resolution? as well as to rezone the property C2. Yes, ma'am, so good. Yes. How about that? <laughs> Simple, you know. We'll, 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 we'll be efficient tonight. Yeah. 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 All right. Any further discussion? Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those in favor, motion carries you now. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is the Stanford Wastewater Treatment contract, reservation, 
you have the agreement, um, you have the draft in your package, <coughs> and Paul Messick is going to take us through this. There's a memo regarding uh, the draft. This is the draft that was previously approved. Um, in so much Paul Messick that Stanford was not willing to accept a change, is that correct? Uh, not so much a question of not willing to, but um, let, me, let me just back up. The, the, the color in your agenda package is if yours is put together like mine is. Uh, the, the color sheet is should be towards the end of the um, of the contract as Exhibit A, the point of delivery. That, that's the only, at the present time, that's the only map we got going from Pittsburgh to Sanford, so that shows the general route that it's going to take. Um, so, so that should be at the back of the contract. The, <coughs> this version of the contract is, is identical to what you all adopted, I guess, four weeks ago with, with three different changes that have been made since then. Um, one is on page three in section D, uh, the second paragraph of that, which talks about the uh, acquisition of additional capacity uh, for wastewater treatment uh, in the event that Pittsburgh, with a separate contract, should purchase reuse water from Sanford. Uh, Mr. Fioco has suggested that perhaps that uh, acquisition of reuse water by other parties as well as Pittsburgh might allow the um, additional wastewater capacity. Sanford, um, I don't think, understood what Mr. Fioco was intending, but in any event, they didn't want to do it anyway. Um, so this version, the version in this contract is what was in the original version that says basically that Pittsburgh can get additional wastewater capacity if Pittsburgh buys additional, I mean, what, uh, buys reuse water from Sam. So it's, um, that is to be determined if and when the town ever desires to buy reuse water. The other change was the, um, uh, the date changed from November to January for the, um, delivery of actual cost information in, in terms of treatment. Um, the change was suggested by Sanford because uh, on the assumption that Pittsburgh wanted to have actual figures based upon a certified audit, the audit wouldn't be finished until November and not approved until the, by the local government commission in December, which is the way ours works. Uh, so January 2nd would be the earliest that the, the um, certified uh, information could be made available. Um, and the other uh, change was on Exhibit C, where the calculation of the capacity charge was described. The, um, the date was blank in the version that you all approved uh, before. Uh, Sanford has suggested January 1, 2018. Uh, the purpose of a date there is that uh, this particular language deals with when the calculation is made as to the, um, the amount of the capacity fee to be paid. Um, and it is based upon, in the first two options, upon the closing of the um, revolving fund loan with the state or some other alternative financing if that were not available. And then Sanford had wanted a, a specific date um, because everything else was so uh, uncertain. Um, and so Mr. Um, At any rate, they have suggested January 1. I think that's too soon. You're not going to have your ducks in a row by then. Uh, and based upon information that we received from Wooten Company and their estimate of the time frames involved, May 1, 2018 would be an earlier and better day. Um, because there's design work that has to be done, the contract has to be bid, and, and um, uh, that sort of thing. And, for, and then the local government commission has to, I mean, the State has to approve the bid and the contract and all that sort of thing. So May would probably be the earliest before you could ever award a contract, and you have to have a loan in place and the, or the funds available in, in place in order to be able to award the contract. So May one would be what I would suggest. The reason for that is that the date, uh, that whatever date that is, whether it's the earliest of either May one or the closing date, if it were earlier than that would peg the amount of the Sanford long-term debt um, amount in terms of calculation of the capacity fee, which would be pegged at 
whatever that debt amount is times 16.67 percent, which would be just for a share of the capacity. And then, of course, that would be then calculated into payments over an extended period of time. The first payment wouldn't be until the anniversary of the actual uh, connection of the force main with Sanford. So even if you were to start construction on May 1, it would be a year before you actually finish the force main and get connected, and then it would be another year before you ever had to make the first payment. So um, payment is a long way down the road, but uh, for purposes of this contract, it's, it's just a date certain, um, and, and the, the amount of the debt is calculated at the earlier of those three different things. So other than that, it's the same as what you all have adopted. And the board received a copy from Paul Nesson and Bob Epping's letter after his review of the contract. Um, for those of you who haven't read it as carefully, I'll put another copy of that on your desk tonight. So um, basically, Bob uh, Epping felt that the, the contract was, uh, was uh, well at, uh, well done, and that the he had a question with respect to um, the language about termination and um, and whether this contract would be perpetual and uh, in in nature, and um, but otherwise he felt that the contract complied with standard kinds of, of um, provisions. Are there any questions with respect to Paul Messick or Bob Eskin's input to the contract? There is um, a memo that has been given to us by uh, Commissioner John Bonnet, who is absent tonight because of an illness, and um, uh, he has, has uh, he seems to that he would be inclined to support the approval of the fourth main agreement um, and ask that um, in the future that we receive delivery of documents electronically and hard copy so that he could do, uh, so that they would be text searchable and indexed. I believe he's referring to the Wooten contract in that regard. Thank you. Yes, that's right. They just say all future all this is digital. If you want to have it. Well, in order to get uh, funding for this force main, we'll have to get approval from the OTC. Um, if in fact the funding comes from the state, then I think what Mr. is saying is it's going to take us through. May or until May. <coughs> but if it doesn't come through the state and we have to do an alternative route of funding, then that last time. And I would rather that the date certain when we agree as to the amount of um, capital payment we're going to make Sanford would be the catch all. So that it is the worst case scenario that this fixed date we provide. Because odds are we will come to an arrangement prior to that date, and that will set the amount of capital. So, one, not January 1. Um, I would just assume we get out January 1, 2019. Odds are we will come to a funding arrangement prior to that date. Because they know later than. Well, that's what the date is. That's not exactly what the date is. It's the first of three conditions. It's not really not the, the later of, it's the earlier of. And, well, and it was intended to be a, a reasonable approximation of when the closing would occur. Based upon the information we've received from the Wooten, it's May 1. If you think that January 1, 19 would be a more reasonable estimate of when the funds would be available, 
then that's the way we will count you. That's that's what you all want to do. Based on your uh, meetings with the temper, what how do you think they would respond to the to Since the number changes four hundred thousand dollars a year, it might not make any difference at all. I was going to say they probably wouldn't agree to it because it is four hundred thousand dollars a year. Different. And the reason for that, Paul Nessick, is that is that um, if if we use the either the May or the January date in there, and and we and we begin to look at the at the, at the cost of Sanford's uh, debt at that point. That's the gauge from which everything else continues that's, through the that's, that's the date upon which the, the capacity fee is calculated, yeah. and it's going to be $6 million, there, you know, give or take, you know, 500000 uh, or so. So, um, but that's going to be payable over 25 years, and, you know, it's not going to be for at least two years past that. So, um, Because there, there was no, you know, the, the date of when this all, can, the funds can be available is not known because there's so many other variables here today. Later on, we'll have a better idea. But right now, the best estimate is May 1. Um, and, but, I mean, I understand what Mr. Belko is saying. The, the further out it goes, the better for the fiscal. Well, I think when we first were thinking about this, we thought the date that would be appropriate was the day that first drop arrived at Sanford. Right. So this is quite a, quite a back off of that date. So, and again, this particular date is the catch-off. That if the budget occurs and funding happens after January 1, 2019, the amount owed the debt service is paid in January 2019. So I, just, I think it's reasonable. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Brian, do you you look like you had something you wanted to say? Mm, no. no, I think I thought so. So you're concerned that they would agree to it? I think it's totally agreeable uh, from our point of view. I don't disagree that we would ask for that, but I don't think that Sanford agrees to it based on their previous session. That's just, I think, I mean, that's just the issue. I think that's just a matter of perspective because it's worth four hundred thousand dollars to them to not to agree to that date. That's I mean that's my only input I guess in that regard. Until we ask, I don't know exactly what the answer is. So there's no harm really in requesting it, or is there? Or is that going to be a straw that's going to break a camel's back? It would be better if you all were to consider this sort of in an alternative situation in order to go forward when you can prove it. With 19 date, but in the event they didn't agree, then you could come back with the May 1 date. Or something in between. Or yeah, yeah, some other number, other than January 8th. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, we have to come back every two weeks. the contract on uh, May 1st, 2018. They would be in, in game construction shortly after that. It would be approximately 13 months for construction. Every year without service. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry? And you're saying that uh, the start delivery that's when the additional 
two MGU capacity. Yeah, we would not be without service for 15 months. That would create all sorts of bigger problems. What if we went with the January 1st, but then as, a, as far as the motion is a backup, what we have a petition that they don't agree to it, and we have already in place the second year? You just want to not then? I would just recommend this is our day. Yeah. And if they've got another idea, then put another date to it. Okay? I mean, that's why I'll be doing it. Permit is for a defined period of time, yeah. and so uh, even if there is a two million gallon a day solution on the table here, that, that that's not to take away from the need that's already been expressed in all the, the permits that we have. So it, it's the quality of the water and the, the, the capability of the stream to receive the water. I think is what's critical for the permit, not where the other sewer is going. Well, it's just that I. I remember that the uh, discharge permit into either the Hall or the Jordan Lake area at the time it was given was in um, uh, in favor. It's now very much out of favor environmentally, and um, uh, and so I'm just hoping that that something will not be taken back because it's perceived that we've solved the problem. At one extent. Well, I don't think we have that in the yeah, 
his question relates to the next matter on your agenda, not this matter. Okay, okay, thank you. by Jay Farrell to make the budget amendment for the Stanford Fourth Main Project for professional services by the Wooten Company. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Michael Fiocco. <coughs> Any further questions? Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Motion carries unanimously. The next item under old business is the hotel incentive that we started discussing at the last meeting. Brian, please request. to be to approve the budget amendment, not necessarily to include approving the contract with Wood. Okay. Um, Jay Farrell, would you be willing to amend your motion that it not only approve the budget amendment, but also to authorize me to execute the service agreement with Wooden Company? Certainly. I'll uh, amend my motion to include the budget amendment and um, Proceed with the mayor to the agreement for professional services with Luke. That you seconded? Is that? Yes. Is that uh, agreeable with you? Yes. Okay, so now we are amended as to that motion. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The, um, uh, in my memo, I outlined um, where uh, where I think the board, after some presentation from uh, Eco, uh, Chatham Park, and uh, uh, Chatham uh, Economic Development Corporation, uh, and then subsequent board discussion, where the board fell on the issues of proposed incentives for hotels. Um, you'll recall that also the Chatham EDC presented some scenarios for an incentive, um, a property tax incentive to the hotel uh, based on the county uh, incentives model. Uh, from that discussion, we came up with, I think, some marching orders here in the, the, the first four items there, which is that uh, we wanted to develop some specific commitments between uh, the hotel and the town. Uh, that are particular to the town, uh, and then number two, uh, that we um, possibly look at uh, structuring the incentives to uh, be a little bit more conservative um, in terms of the town's ability um, to retain some of its property tax revenue from uh, the added growth in order to keep up with some pace development and some of the needs of development would, uh, would create for the town. 
and then third, that I come up with some ideas, uh, which I think I tried to outline in this memo, and then also, too, that we don't set a public hearing any earlier than March 27, 2017. Uh, I see Mr. Bonnets had sent an email earlier uh, earlier today uh, asking if uh, asking if we could consider lead uh, certification as well. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll admit I don't remember that from the conversation, but it may have very well have happened. There wasn't any uh, intent to omit that uh, from the document, but uh, if you wish to consider LEED certification or a building that could be LEED certified, that's certainly something that uh, you might consider uh, as well. Uh, the um, the uh, uh, attack, the issue of of uh, some of the commitments uh, that we talked about that are particular, that we, we identified a need for that are particular in Pittsburgh. Um, I put five items here, and if you want to add or subtract, that's fine. Um, first one uh, would commit the operator, the hotel operator, to hiring local employees. Uh, the second would that uh, be that, uh, that the operator commit to um, uh, complying with um, the Chatham Park Master Plan and additional elements requirements. I should have said with regard to local artists. I continue on in the next sentence that, that uh, it must certify that uh, it's displaying the work of local artists. Uh, the third would be that the operator would work with Chatham EDC and you know, possibly any other chamber of commerce, PBA, uh, et cetera, to market local businesses and attractions um, and that they provide a, a way and a means to do that. Uh, fourth, I think was brought up specifically by the board to provide hotel transportation and its guests to local businesses and events. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Bradley from ECO indicated that there would be transportation available at the hotel, but um, you know maybe that is something we want to consider um, just kind of formalizing this commitment anyway. And then finally, uh, well maybe not finally, finally as far as the points I listed here, uh, that the operator would provide links on the hotel website to local businesses and attractions, continuing kind of with the marketing piece there. Um, and certainly, like I said, you can you can tell me if, if that's sideways or if should, there should be more added to it or uh, taken away or, or what have you. Um, I'll, I'll just identify real briefly the uh, discussion on incentives. You'll see here uh, that this was the incentive package basically that was presented the last time as far as Chatham County was concerned. You can see that this is their tax rate. This is how they would structure uh, they would structure their uh, give back, so to speak. Um, now keep in mind this incentive was essentially a 90% grant back to the developer, or the hotel operator uh, of the added uh, taxable revenue. Uh, property tax revenue. So in this case, they would be the incentive amount from the grant amount would be Chatham County would be giving seventy-nine thousand eight hundred approximately eighty thousand dollars back. Chatham County would be keeping eighty-eight hundred. That's the that's the maximum model that Chatham County approved uh, when they discussed this last December. It's my understanding they don't have an agreement on this, uh, and they're working to that issue right now. The, if we were to take the same approach with the town, and this was the policy that was, this was kind of the, the estimate that was uh, Mr. Touchstone from EDC had thrown out, uh, using a similar scale, um, you know, in other words, a 90% incentive, you can see that the town would receive approximately 6,000 in the first year, um, and, then, and then eventually that would ramp up. Uh, year five would be granting a 60% incentive um, and that eventually year six would be uh, would be going away. Um, the um, uh, the other point that I wanted to make on that I think there was an email that was distributed to at one point. Um, the, the mayor provided a copy for me where the sender I think indicated that um, the town does not receive sales tax revenue um, from the county, and that's not accurate. Uh, Double check today, and we receive about three quarters of a million dollars in sales tax revenue uh, through the county. So obviously, the, that would be by the time that this hotel was built, that would be at minimum seven hundred fifty thousand dollars plus tax. So we would still be receiving sales tax revenue from this. This this type of incentive, this proposed incentive, uh, would not be affecting our continued collection of sales tax revenue. Which presumably, it would be larger as a result uh, as a result of this. Uh, 
out of it. So one of the things that I took away from the discussion, as I mentioned um, before, um, is that we might want to take a look at um, becoming a little bit less aggressive with the incentives package given that um, the town is in uh, a slightly different position as far as, I don't want to say that the county doesn't need the revenue, but certainly we're in a position where we most definitely do. So if we look at if we look at this first idea, instead of 90% in year one, reducing that to 60%, which rather than uh, rather than uh, creating a net tax revenue of $6,000, we would be receiving approximately $18,000 more in tax revenue in year one, and then uh, scaling that down so that each year we would be receiving uh, progressively more tax revenue with. Uh, less of an incentive that was granted until eventually after year six, same as the others, it would go away. Um, and that was just, you know, that was just uh, you know, taking a number uh, percentage and then making it smaller to something that, that to me felt a little bit more comfortable. Now I mentioned that we could also go to uh, a, an approach similar to what Cyber City does right now, which I believe is a flat 50%. Uh, and you know, so in other words, they're taking the added uh, taxable value, they're um, applying a 50% incentive, uh, and then that would mean that we, uh, you know, we create a uh, net tax revenue of, of 30%, or excuse me, $30,000 for years one through five. Pretty simple uh, number to remember, um, and I think it has a lot more value in it than the previous example. In other words, we're collecting more at an earlier stage than we would with the previous example. And then finally, the third, the third example that I provided um, was kind of flipping the first example on its head a little bit, and that's starting out with a lower incentive, but ramping it up over time, uh, so that you know we're still receiving more than what the county is proposing, uh, and you know what we discussed at the previous meeting, but um, you know in terms of a 40% incentive but we're allowing for more of an incentive, granting more of an incentive towards the operator um, at later stages um, because presumably by year five, we would be in a better um, ad valorem tax revenue position than year one, and we could, we, we could maybe better afford it and still provide some value to the operator. So um, again, this is, uh, these are just three examples that I provided in terms of uh, ability. I discussed these a little bit with uh, with uh, Kyle uh, Touchstone at PEC. Uh, he doesn't think anything is, is uh, you know, looks uh, like a deal breaker in any of those three examples that we talked about, um, nor in any of the commitments that we talked about. And then certainly um, the ability of Chatham EDC to help certify some of the requirements that we would ask um, within those commitments um, of the hotel operator, for example, um, certifying the number of jobs, certifying local artists, things of that nature, Chad and EDC, that's why they made the big dollars uh, to help us out in a situation like that. So we could certainly put them to work on that as well. So, um, the, um, again, they're flexible, can be reworked based on your overall preferences uh, and how you want to approach it. Um, I would want to be certain that uh, anything we do, like I mentioned in the previous meeting, anything that we do in terms of final resolution of this issue, uh, that we be very specific, that we state the need for uh, the hotel and really what we're trying to get out of uh, whatever it is that we're incentivizing. Uh, so in this case, we have a very needed, uh, I, think, I, I think all of us kind of come to some sort of informal uh, agreement the area needs a hotel. Uh, the county certainly had their reasons for uh, uh, for entering into this incentive, into entering into their max incentive package uh, to really kind of help stimulate the use and, and growth of their ag center. Um, I think from the, the town's overall perspective, um, we you know, we certainly lack um, places, uh, beds uh, for folks to stay at. Even though we've got a couple of uh, three. Uh, excellent B and B's and relatives of mine have stayed at and speak highly of, but we still need more beds. And so uh, this provides, in theory, a way to get us there uh, at a slightly faster uh, pace, um, but at, at, at some cost. And so that has to be considered as well. Uh, and with that, um, 
not asking for any direction tonight. If you wish to discuss and provide some uh, uh, specific instructions for us to follow up on, we certainly can do that. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, one thing that is required by statute is that uh, before you take action on it, you have to have minimum hold the public hearing uh, on the specific uh, things that you want to do within the, uh, the package. And then, uh, following that, then you would have to develop an agreement of some sort to, I think, formalize all of this uh, with the developer. So with that, I'll tap out. Any other comments or questions you have? To reiterating the need for hotel, I guess it was the Barrington Folkart um, show was this weekend at Barrington Barn, and people were staying in Durham in hotels because they couldn't get the rooms in Chapel Hill that were in the, like that. We would have got a lot of business from that this weekend. So we'll see a lot of overflow beyond what uh, our own population is here. Other questions for Brian Brisbane? I'd like to see some analysis of estimated sales tax revenue. So if Kyle could pull something together on, on that, that would be very helpful for me to better understand the equation. One of the things that we had talked about last time was to look at uh, Carborough, who is just going into uh, very recently. Uh, uh, Hampton Inn, and uh, that jurisdiction has an occupancy tax. I remember it being just barely discussed. Um, does anyone, I mean, I know that the to put us under an occupancy tax would require a local bill from our legislators, which I can't imagine they would have a hard time with, but, um, uh, but perhaps I'm being politically naive or smelling for me. Different day. But um, providing that kind of um, support that way, um, it's, it's an occupancy tax obviously then means that the people who are occupying the hotel are in, in essence paying the paying the fare and um, and it's not coming out of our of our revenues per se. So um, does anyone remember that Kyle or Kirk Bradley had um, any, any comments about trying to get an occupancy tax pass for our jurisdiction? Maybe Kyle could speak to that as an issue as well.
So we need to put the brakes on, on this. So um, if you were inclined to approve the sewer allocation request, I do believe that they would be moving very quickly to full building permits and subdivide the property for the town hall lots. So um, what was approved is was the special use or special uh, exception uh, to have town, town homes in R10. Um, the property was rezoned to R10 during the same project. It was it used to be commercial, and then it was rezoned to R10. Um, and then along with that rezoning was a special use permit uh, to have it um, have town homes there. Three units being total. So that property is subject to the special use permit. You cannot do anything other than that use. That's right. So other other than an R10, normal, whatever is permitted in R10. Yeah. Which would be mostly single family residential type of thing. Well, I, I support the project that. I support that. Um, I guess the only thing that might have changed is that we know now that. Thompson's is going to need to be widened exponentially. Is there, I, I'm remembering that, that that plan was pretty close to Thompson Street. So is once, um, yeah. once Bailey's Academy is, is in there and we're needing to move that street, is that going to impact? Well, it's a little further down than the impact of Bailey's and Chatham Park and their entrance. So it's a little further down um, east of this area. Um, I'm not sure the discussion at the time when the townhomes were coming through regarding road widening or sidewalks. There were none. There were none. So that, um, that might not be the case today. If that came in, we would maybe look at it a little bit more, but there wasn't any. then you would be in a position to give them a selling compliance yes. certificate. Yes. Take that, get a building permit. Yes. And sign off on the plan. Well, I would uh, then make a motion to approve this allocation subject to them pulling a building permit within one year. You've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Michael Fierro. Second by Pat Wilson I mean, it, we didn't really breathe too hard to get the next two meetings uh, scheduled in uh, April 10th. Of course, we don't we don't always see um, we don't always see more than a couple meetings in advance. But I, I would be surprised if in the future we have we have. And I don't think I want to go more than three meetings in advance because I don't know how useful that is. If you have, I mean, I can give you an idea if you really have a question about it, um, but. It's kind of sketchy, and, and just the other thing I would keep in mind too is that you know this thing's kind of organic. I mean, there might be something that gets yanked. Uh, if that's the case, you know, ask me why, uh, or I'll try to tell you uh, on, on one or the other. So if it's helpful, great. Um, it's it certainly I think is a useful thing to put out there. And it doesn't create any more paper work by and large than what we're doing already. So I think everybody hopefully is happy. Thank you. And, uh, I think the only other thing I would I would add as far as reports are concerned, um, and then I'll tap out, is that uh, you have my report here, is that uh, the sidewalk over on Pittsburgh Elementary School Drive, uh, correct, go ahead and uh, 
update if I miss anything. The short story of that is that uh, the survey, the original survey, uh, construction survey that was done on the property was inaccurate. Uh, our survey, our, our inspections noticed this. Um, and so we, um, I guess we basically put, uh, put things into motion to get uh, the sidewalk uh, place where it needs to belong or where it needs to go. And so what you see, what you saw up there this afternoon anyway, was basically a pile of concrete rubble that will be report, re report hopefully tomorrow. So we apologize to anyone that's tried to walk on it. I think I think the issue of the guy wire is going to be resolved or at this. Resolved. It's resolved. Okay. So that shouldn't be in the way. Uh, and we should be just about once once the sidewalk is reported, we should be in good shape to have walkers and everyone else on it. So the, the 87 portion is done. And I think. It's I was glad to see the kiosks here have been delivered and they'll be installed. And um, every once in a while, um, I yeah. wonder, you know, it, it, it does take a long time for all those yeah. kinds of things to be done. But um, so. Um, no, we just need to know it. Well, okay, I don't know if. I don't mean we don't know. We don't have them finalized yet. Yeah. 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 They're bigger than you think. Only when you get out there and measure them relative to our sidewalks in the town, they they are bigger than you think. And you can say, well, let me shrink them a little bit. This is before they were a quarter. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, no, that's not big enough to put a poster on it. So it's not. And I have found it's not as easy as you think to put them downtown. So I mean, we've got two locations that we'll talk about. The pocket park is one is one of the best um, locations we've found. Yeah. Yeah. Was that going to say? Uh, yes. Uh, don't know about property. There's one there That's not in the public. Well, so We've already talked about our traffic circle meeting will be tomorrow night at 6 And um, are there any other questions about about the manager's update? If not, then we'll move to Commissioner of Concerns, Jay Farrell. Um, Mr. Green, thank you. Just took care of one line uh, that was a sidewalk. Um, the other one, uh, you got a call from the lady on the uh, Actually, today again, on uh, she lives on the corner of West Corn Wallace and Winsong. I believe that's the street that goes in the pot of stone. I know I talked to, to you about this about a year ago. Somehow, some part of that road is state and some of it's town. It's not paid. Is there any way we can do anything to either get that on our pavement schedule or see what the state can do? Yeah, we've, we've talked to the state about that, and uh, the, um, the, uh, I don't, the, the issue that I have with it is, is I would prefer that the state actually paid that as opposed to having the town pay that, um, but uh, I think that, you know, the, the state is willing to give up uh, roads like that. Um, we're actually probably going to be looking at Cross the line here shortly. They're more than more than willing to give up maintenance responsibility for certain roads. It's my position that I would rather have them get the road in position, um, you know, and have them actually pave it since it's their road right now. Um, but that's something we need we need to finalize with the state. The other thing is that we're running through um, an area of town uh, that road would essentially be running through an area of town that is not in town. Mm -hmm. 
so we're kind of we're paving an area of town that isn't receiving, you know, should you know, we're not receiving ad or property tax from them, kind of giving them a town benefit. You can't do that. So you can't, you can't pave the street outside of town. You can't have a street outside of town. Okay, is your constituent <coughs> to be incorporated into the town? Well, I think she is because she's in the Farmstone Development, but that road goes right by the side of her house. She's on that corner lot in Farmstone. And, and the traffic and all that. That road ends and goes to our fine pocket neighborhood that's sitting down there with, that looks very unattractive. But uh, I, she has just asked me numerous times about this, and I told her it was a state road. It was not, not part of the town. I'll pass her on to Mr. Messi. So the town talked about it. You, you all have talked about it before. I mean, yeah, I know that. Somebody needs to solicit other people's annexation request, and I'm not sure why they want to be in town if they have to pay town taxes. Well, they're not. They're not uh, going to agree to it. They want, they of course not. I mean, the other option there is to just somehow convince the state to pave that road, then, you know, just, which they could certainly do, and then we wouldn't, right. we wouldn't have to worry about the annexation issues. So that's something we can talk about as well. I, in, in that case, the flip side of that is the state really doesn't have any interest in doing it. You know, like the, uh, Maybe after she has, after she has said several times about the potholes in the road it hadn't been scraped or anything like that in a long time. So we can just. Look yeah, into that I, I, yeah, I'm going to be talking to uh, some of those guys tomorrow. Okay. We'll see where we're at with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't really have anything other than the email that we all received from you and Cindy about the trash around that dumpster. Mm -hmm. This is not our jurisdiction. It's just a private individual. I don't know if there's any other steps we can take. Nice that uh, we parked the police car down there next to the dumpster, so it's deterred from dumping. I'm not sure that it has, but um, it's a good touch. Mm -hmm. I don't have a concern. I'm happy to hear that um, uh, the citizens' comments on the UDL will be posted on the website so that everybody can review. Three hundred and forty pages of comments. Okay. They mentioned this kind of seventy pages. Oh really? Yeah. Single space. Probably. Double sided. Yes, double sided. Are they legible? Yes. All right. Emma Baldwin said that she that has nothing to to add to the conversation that she can't add. <laughs> Well, all I can say is that in the year and two months that I've been mayor of this town, I don't believe we've ever gotten out of day 15 before, especially after last meeting when we went to almost quarter after 11. So, um, well, that's so new. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a motion to adjourn from Lucky Kyoto, is there a second? Second. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.